So let's kick off. Hannah, welcome again. Uh, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about you and the Cena? Thank you so much for having me this morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am the director of our systems for our global sourcing organization at Athena. And I have spent the majority of my professional career focused on uh, project implementations, more specifically at, in retail. So I've had um, a stint at you know, Limited Brands, another large retailer in Columbus, in the consulting world, uh, focused again on delivery of solutions. And then the last two years has been spent with Athena. In a nutshell, my, my day job is really being a bridge between our business and our technical partners. So with that said, I'll talk a little bit about our brand, Athena Global Sourcing itself, and then we'll continue to move on. So as you can all see, we are operating under six brands, Justice Brothers, Lane Bryant, Catherine's, Dress Barn, and Marisa's. And overall, Athena is $4.5 billion retail company with 4,000 stores and 50,000 associates. And our main focus is really on clothing, shoes, and accessories. In regards to Cena Global Sourcing, it's our direct sourcing arm. We have 12 locations worldwide, 314 associates, 55 vendors, and 121 factories. This is a really great visual, if you will, that it shows we're, we're really a global organization. And the rest of our conversation that we'll have today will be just focused on, again, the people process and technology and how together with our partners successfully are able to really focus on the, the global customer. Great. So why don't you start off by giving us a introduction to the journey that you um, took. Really maybe perhaps starting off with goals and objectives and then sure. lead us through what's occupied your life for the world. <laughs> you. Perfect. So we had I'll even back up a little bit further. Our journey at Athena started about um, three and a half, four years ago. And it was really to, we had a vision in mind of what we needed and, and in alignment with our goals, but what did our business need? And so there was an evaluation done by one of our third party partners at that time who did an evaluation and, and came up with a short list. And with that said, we have narrowed the short list and trade them with the partner we decided to move forward with. And that included both PLM and then also the merchandise lifecycle management space. So Athena Brands, I should say Tween Brands, Justice Brothers, implemented PLM first. And we went through not only implementation of Brothers Justice, we've got about 200 current users that are using PLM. That includes both our brand in addition to our AGS offices in Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Korea. We quickly moved into then, after stabilization, an optimization project, a branding project. We at Athena have a single instance of trade zone that will be scalable for all of our retail brands in the future, which is very exciting. Um, and then we upgraded, and then we have been focused on the MLM implementation over the last 12 months. So that's, that is the, you know, in a nutshell, over the last four years, three and a half, four years, what we've been doing. More recently, though, we've been focused on five business goals that you see here. We needed a partner, a long-term partner, that could help us achieve optimizing business process, limit compliance risk as we grow, support our growth and acquisition strategy, cost avoidance, and eliminate and consolidate disparate systems and tools that we were using or currently are using. Great, great. You mentioned PLM and MLM there. What, what, what was the distinction between the two that you... Well, for, for, yeah, for PLM, it's, it's really, we, we tr tend to think of PLM as the product design and development component, which, uh, unfortunately, a lot of times we assume they're very separate uh, from the MLM, and that's just not true. You can't disconnect the de design and development from our sourcing and our order management, logistics, finance, costing. So when I think about PLM MLM and I look at the footprint, and we'll we'll talk about a little bit about the Athena's trade zone footprint here in a minute, but uh, it's really that seamless interaction and flow of information from PLM to MLM, and really the the difference was just the timing on when we implemented. In terms of the scope, let, let's actually can you just explain the scope? Sure. So. <laughs> As you can see, we have implemented quite a bit of the trade zone functionality. 
If you look over in product design and development, in those two spaces, we have already, as I mentioned, we are stable with PLM. And the green boxes that you'll see were the in-scope focus areas for our MLM implementation. What you see in blue are in-scope non-focus areas. So for example, Tradestone may have, they've given us an out-of-the-box solution. We're currently not applying that application or the configuration to our current business model. So those are growth opportunities in the future, as I would like to, to call them. So from collaborative sourcing all the way over to MicroStrategy, that's been the our, you know, last 12 months, the entire project team, Tradestone, the leadership have been dedicated and focused to getting the system up and going in those spaces. So let's, let's continue the journey in terms of you saying that all green boxes and white boxes are now alive. If we look at the, the timetable, what's the S? Time scales that it's been a tremendous journey, a lot of hard work, a lot of sweat and tears have gone into the journey. But this is a, a very high level program timeline. So when you think about start, we started, kicked off officially uh, with our business partners in the middle of December and aggressively went into requirements understanding, not so much around uh, gathering, but understanding the business requirements in alignment with the industry model, and we'll talk about industry model that Tradestone came to the table with. So, and then you see us all the way at deployment. We uh, went live with our entire brother's business, the organization, including retail, franchise, and direct uh, merchants, and our AGS supporting partners overseas, in addition to our brother's vendors. So that was quite exciting. A lot been done from December, mid-December of last year to the August time frame. Our cutover weekend was the first part of August and training started the week of the 25th. So we have users right now currently in the system for MLM. There are roughly 60 that are interacting from cost negotiation, order management. Great. Now just as an aside, you've used sort of everyday language there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the translation, as I mentioned, you know, what a big part of my role is really being able to help translate to our, you know, our technical partners, what the business is trying to say, what they really need, and then also on the business side of the house, being able to speak in a business-friendly language, you know, translate the technology. And it's been a really interesting learning. Our business connects the dots much quicker when we don't use acronyms or we don't use technical language. So explaining to them, this is really what requirements mean. That might be an internal project management related. You know, we all understand what that means. But that's really figuring it out. The business says, oh, OK. So what stage are we in? Well, we're figuring it out. Or we're creating what we need. Or we're putting all the pieces together during that build. And then testing, making sure that it all works. So it, it was much easier for them to absorb what was happening. Using everyday language. Yes, using everyday language. It's amazing, small changes culturally and how we talk to one another and communicate really do make a big difference. And we're part of the, why we were so successful over the last 12 months. Great. So you mentioned community. There's obviously groups of people all over the world. Some of those will be working for you across various departments, others speaking different languages, different cultures. Talk to us about the community. Sure. So the community is so important, just the idea of community. It's a simple concept. It's not always easy to agree on what the community means, but this is our community. And every single group here, from executive leadership to our IT, internal IT, to our third-party trade zone, other third-party partners that helped us along the way, whether it's integration or testing, vendor partners who will be using the application, we all had to come to the table with a com our common goals in mind and a common understanding on how we were going to work together. So community, this, this is really the foundation and backbone to our success. And it's, you know, it's working with the right level of people, with the right level of competence, and willing. You, you want to get up and go to work because you, you work well as strategic partners. So how much, how much of your time is actually spent just organizing that community? It's big. You know, we, we've got a lot of very smart, creative, strong personalities amongst the community. And you know, ensuring that everybody understands their role and responsibility and just managing that, it, it's a full time. It's all the time. It's reminding us that, you know, we are holding every one of our partners accountable. And 
especially when times get tough or you're working a, a long 70-hour you know, week, we sometimes forget about that. So we also know at the end of the day, we can't be successful without one another. Do you actually sort of talk to one another across time zones? Do you use technology? Is it all sort of... Yes, we have. And, you know, mind you, every, especially in the business, every functional area in the business that was being impacted, they have different communication styles. And then to your point, you layer in complexity, like 13 hours or 12 hours difference. And English is the second language. That's hard to do. So we do use uh, technology such as, you know, webcast or we'll do a video conference, or we have at Athena some really wonderful technology. It's um, a telepresence, and it really does feel like you're sitting in a boardroom with your cross-functional partners. It's, it's quite neat. So we, we have leveraged a lot of that technology to make sure that we are con in constant communication with our overseas team. I also, along with my uh, technical partner, have traveled to Asia. Uh, being there with, with our Asia teams, introducing ourselves to our vendors, just a name with a face, holding hands, singing Kumbaya, saying, we are here to support you. That is our job. It really brings a lot of respect and, and, and that partnership principle on the Asia side. So we hit it from a lot of different ways. And to tell you, it's, it's that important. If one communication method or mode is not working, you need to ask your partner, is this working for you? And it's okay to ask. We did a lot of asking. Give me feedback. What's not working? Are you getting enough? Are you getting too much? And then reacting quickly to the communication style. Huge. Great. So you involved your suppliers early in the week? Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. When we talk about the reason, a, a big reason as to why we, we need the application, it's really to cross-functional partnership, visibility, and streamlining process, but we wanted to make sure that our vendors didn't feel like we were doing this to them. Ultimately, when it boils down to it, it we engaged them early. They were part of the user acceptance testing, which was a really, you know, they looked at us and said, wow, you're interested in what I think, and you're listening to my feedback, and you're reacting upon that. Now, especially from a cultural perspective in Asia, is we tell you what to do and it's no problem, we're compliant, we're going to do it. So we're getting a lot more open feedback on what's working and what's not just based on surely asking them early in the process, we want you to engage and this, this is why. Great, great. So there's a lot of ways of approaching the project. You know, one of them is the classic as it is and to be process. That isn't the approach that, that you chose. You took more of an 80-20 We did. Approach. Yeah, we, you know, the industry model approach is what you may call it, and, and I, I love this. And for all of my, our Athena partners that are on the phone, this, this is another one of our guiding principles here. What this represents is, you know, our trade stone out of the box solution. And though it's not completely out of the box, to your point, it's you know that 80-20 rule. We pick and choose where we want to configure the system to meet the business needs. Now, we did not customize that. That's really important. So. Keeping with an industry model thing, let's go in with a perspective, let's work with our trade stone partner on an industry model, and let's get it in, and then we'll react once users start using the system, and we have an opportunity to, in the future, then optimize based on industry model. It was also really important to take the industry model approach. This is not just a solution for our Justice and Brothers brands who happen to be going first. This is a solution for all our Athena brands. So the expectation in the future will be our, our other brands, Maurice's, for example, or Dress Barn, they will start to collaborate with AGS and market vendors in the future using the application. So we needed to build something that was flexible enough to work for most. We didn't want to get into a situation where we went on to the next brand and the application was just not, it was so customized towards Justice and Brothers it wouldn't work. Okay, great. So really it's a cascade approach. We've seen it with some of our other customers where they adopt best practice, they take that best practice, modify it on an 80-20 logic for, to effectively give a senior group practice, mm -hmm. and then cascade that logic through to the various divisions and banners within the team. Absolutely. Yeah. So how is it that you must have got requests from clients that stemmed out of the 80%. How did you manage that sort of expectation? The package is flexible, you could have done 50-50, 60-40 /50, the other way. How did you actually control the expectation? How, how did you say no to a bunch <laughs> of very strong-willed business executives that kept saying why, why, why? 
it was setting the expectation up front that this is what we're doing, strategically speaking. And you have to trust that the project leadership team knows what we're doing. And they did, and they're committed. So when we had to go back and say no, and this is why, they understood. It was never easy, but they got it. We set a very defined scope. We tried our best to keep to that scope. And we said, listen, there's always the future. We're not promising when, we're not promising even if, but there's always the future. So we have been gathering enhancement requests. More will come out of our brother's organization as they're now up and running on the application. More enhancement requests will come from our justice business. They'll say, hey, can we do this? And it's our job, my job, along with my technical partner's job, to make sure that we are managing those requests. We are communicating clearly to our stakeholders that we're not doing this now, and it might not ever get done. It's based on total effort, resource availability, et cetera, but just know it's captured. And, and that's working. Right. So the parking lot concept it really is. now, yeah. get them live, and then actually sort of when they're using the system, presumably there'll be another wave of recommendations yeah. and also go back into the parking lot. Yeah, absolutely. And we are, what I can say about, you know, the last three years or two years is that when we did the optimization project at Justice, that is really, it should be part of most everyone's philosophy when implementing. It's get it in, get it simple. You, know, you don't know what you don't know, and you don't know what tomorrow looks like, especially in retail. So if you want to over-customize for today, you're already obsolete. You always have the chance to come back then and optimize. So keeping it simple is going to really prevent a lot of heartache in the future. So, so this is that second part of the configure, how do we do it? So it's building the Justice and Brothers house first, and you'll see the little houses in the background. Essentially, those are our other brands. We're building the infrastructure today, the configuration that is a highly industry model, or that 80-20 rule, if you will, and justice is going to move into the house. So I love the analogy. And then we're going to move on as a project team. We're going to focus on our next brand. We're going to give them some unique things, brand specific, perhaps reporting, for example. And then we're going to continue to move on and build a neighborhood, which is all of our Athena brands. Great. Just before we move on, what about a category level? Was there any category discussion? How did you sort of approach it? People from various categories get together. We sometimes see that. Yes. Even though it's across several divisions. So I think what you're asking me is really, how do we determine within the house who gets to come on? How do we roll them out? Is that yes. what you're asking? Who goes first? So it's really it's about, it's about you know risk first and foremost. When when we the project team and I sit down and we start having initial conversations around the audience that will be impacted and timing. So you know first of all, what does the deployment strategy look like? We're going to pilot and do a big bang. Are we going to do multiple rollouts? Well, we have decided what, what works really well for us, by the way, is we go in with a, a pilot mentality, if you will. Now, mind you, it's the entire brother's organization that went first. So I, I, you know, though they're considered pilot, that's pretty significant. But we think about you know product that has, we, we want to make sure that it's product representative of both market vendor and direct source, for example all three countries, so department-wise. We want to make sure that we're representing our store, franchise, and our direct teams. And also the resources that might overlap and manage multiple departments. We want to try and avoid keeping resources working multiple ways. So that's another big one. Departments, you know, high degree of executive leadership is really important. We have the best stakeholder from our brother's organization. Uh, she's our GMM, and she has been a cheerleader and a driver and a pusher for us. And we knew there was no question that she had buy-in. She, she was going to support her resources. She was in it for the long haul. So that's another really important part of selecting how you whittle down and select, whether it's at the department or business level, um, how you roll out. Great. So let's move on to your adoption strategy and sort of communication. We really, you know, see a, a, a different picture across different sort of clients, and, and it tends to be that the those that are more successful on time and on budget have a very strong communication. Yeah, you component. can't. You know, at the end of the day, your project will be successful only if your business, those that are being impacted, say it's successful. 
So even though we do have success metrics like on time, on budget, and we could be all of those things, if the business turns around and says, this is horrible, I hate it, it was not worth the investment. Right? So how do you get your users there? How do you get them to love decisions that were made above and beyond their head? Right? You, uh, adoption is so critical. And so what, what we're talking about here, all uh, part of the user readiness or adoption strategy, communication. We talked a little bit about communication and tools that we've used, not just in the states, but of course overseas with our AGF offices and our vendor partners. We've got to have multiple communication strategies. So it's how we're delivering communication. It's timing on communication. There are some fairly standard cadences, if you will. You know, for example, four weeks prior to a training class is when the expectation is users are going to see that save the date on their calendar. So it's a mutual respect, it's communicating often, receiving feedback, and then following back up with that loop. Right. Now, now did you use any sort of video or social? We did. Yeah. We did. We had this amazing video, and I've probably shared it with everyone under the sun. And in fact, for any of our listeners today that will be at STARS, you will see it. But it was this amazing video put together that had you know, the music and the sound. Uh, you know, it was just upbeat. It explained what we were doing, it, how we were approaching this project. And we share it often with our business. We share it as an internal marketing tool with our other brands. We send it to our vendor partners. So that, that was big. Great. Great, great. So if we look at the rewards, you were talking about rewards. What are the tips and tricks? Because we, we hear all sorts of <laughs> motivation techniques, from cuddly toys to... To, to just bribery and paying them off and happy hours. Yes, we do all of those things. And, it, and they all work really, really well. So rewards and recognition programs. So it, it's not only about rewarding and recognizing our business, subject matter experts, for example. It's about rewarding and recognizing our project team. So we have a Weekly Warrior Award, and it is a, there's a giant trophy that my uh, technical partner had and brought in. And every week, one of our hardworking project partners, whether it's IT, whether it's Tradestone, uh, whether it's business, they will pass it to one another for extraordinary work effort and partnership. So that's really been motivating. Uh, for our, on the business side of the house, we have a Citizen of the Month Award, which is a really important award. We've got, you know, from a mug to Starbucks gift cards, but it's a, you know, four people have that mug. <laughs> four people, that's it. So when you get to scream at the top of the rooftop, you put on the intranet a big story, a page about why this person has been so critical to our project, it keeps people really motivated. And then as I mentioned, you know, of course, you know, cash drawings and bribery and all of those things are always fun too. But I tell you, it's, it's, you know, it gets your, your business's attention when you invest in rewards, recognition, making it a big deal. I mean, this is, uh, for most people involved in this project, on the business side, they have full-time jobs and then some. So to ask them to provide either knowledge or time to make our project successful, they, they deserve that reward. Great. And you've got the customer advisory board. Yeah. There. So how, how did that operate? So the internal customer advisory board is being formulated as part of our steady state merge the MLM project. So what that will entail will be stakeholders that were impacted by a project at a specific brand. And as we continue to roll out to our different brands, we will have brand representation and stakeholders that will stay part of an active board to talk about enhancements. You know, we have, as I mentioned, a single instance of Tradestone. And so what that means is we can't let you know, one of our brands go wild and customize or consider the application that doesn't work for another brand. So it's really about continuously getting that feedback loop. And if, if I might just back up, you know, part of the adoption strategy is if you think that users are adopting and everything is hunky-dory, if you let that go to the wayside and don't manage and coddle it, they will very quickly revert either back to bad behavior, bad activity. So the customer advisory board is really just it's a forum to, to be able to uh, inform to check in, how are users using, talk about best practices, share those best practices among brand partners, and ensure that we are continuing to move forward. Let's actually um, move on to the other aspect. I know you were keen on partnership principles. 
you know, when I think about community and success, and I talked a little bit about holding everyone accountable, partnership principles were introduced during our design phase, or figuring out what the business needed phase, right? And it didn't just, uh, you know, this wasn't just about the business partnership, it was about the entire community. So I knew that my, my technical partners that traced down, you were going to be accountable, you were going to trust, respect, be patient, being reasonable, that was a big stickler. You know, you've got to be reasonable with one another. We're all working towards a successful goal, and that goal is the same. So appreciating one another, civility, these are really important components that we all understood up front. We agreed that these were reasonable as a project community and team, and that it's a tool that I can now hold folks accountable if they're not behaving in this way. So something really important to set up front, it's all about setting expectations and, and the, the ground rules for how we're going to work with one another. Okay, so we're coming to the end of our time, but how about um, goals and revisiting the goals and benefits? Did we realize how the business feel? How are they coping with this new system and one version of the truth? Yeah, so, you know, as I mentioned, we are piloting with our brother's team. And we are starting to realize some of our, um, of, of our business goals. So for example, you know, efficiency gains. We are, you know, and that's part of the optimizing business process. We're integrating information between Tradestone and our brand purchase order management system. So our brands will be using their own purchase order system of record. And then Athena Global Sourcing is using Tradestone of our system of entry and purchase order system of record. So there's integration. We've hooked the two up. So once costing is complete and cell channels built and all of that fun stuff, then you know, that information that merchants, brand buyers, excuse me, used to have to type into their purchase order system can now be auto-populated. That's a really big efficiency gain. Now, on the other side of that, from a purchase order management perspective, our vendor partners, now that they're able to come into the system, our AGS folks don't have to email purchase orders. That's huge. The time savings and distilling and emailing tech packs or purchase order information is absolutely, it's incredible how much time had to be spent doing that activity. Another great example, limit compliance risk, you know, as we grow, there was a recent situation where one of our vendor partners couldn't see purchase order. And we found out that the factory hadn't completed audit yet. That's a good thing. And you know, we found out really quickly that you know, we don't want to send an order to a factory that is not compliant. So we were able to, w within the system, identify really quickly that that was not a proof, an approved factory. So you know, this, we're avoiding risk, unnecessary risk with an example like that. And what about the sort of deceptive tools? Have, have people clung on to their old, old tools? Or yes. have, you know, what, how did you actually kill those old tools? <laughs> well, it's a slow death, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> it's really a slow death. You know, we've got to be able to provide a tool that has the same information, but our users have to, have to be able to identify that that's what you're giving them. And when I say identify, you know, you could have 20 bits of information on two very different looking tools, and that will throw someone off if it's not organized in a really specific way. That's really where the change management comes in. So sometimes you have to do a little more hand-holding, sitting down and saying, your image, you, you know, your text document, it's still there. It, it just might be in a little different location. So it's getting used to new tools, I should say. Okay. One of the questions that came up just now was about interruption. Do people, is there less interruption across departments now that they've got access? the tool, I presume. So, interruption. I think, I think the, the question that was raised was, without a system, presumably the various departments continually have to track where, where each other are. Oh, yeah. that, has that led to less interruption? Well, I, I, wouldn't, I, I couldn't measure that at this point in time. We know that, we, here are the facts, we know that you know, our brand buyers and AGS are using the system for costing and that they're receiving purchase orders, and that they're able to you know, create some development sample requests or sample requests, for example. We know that they have the capability in, absolutely. Something else I'd like to say is threaded messaging. So we use threaded messaging pretty heavily in, in the organization, and that's, that's been a really important 
tool. So I have seen some email die down because of that. Cool. So what next? So what's next? We are currently focused on ensuring our justice organization, who is our next rollout group. So as I mentioned, Brothers went first. We'll be rolling out to the majority of all of our apparel departments and categories for justice. So we need to make sure that justice is stable as well. It's going to be a, a large effort. In addition to that uh, project leadership, we are planning our next brand implementation. And from you know, a cadence perspective, if you will, we have identified that before each brand, we want to evaluate an optimization or even perhaps an upgrade is necessary before we move into our next brand. So that's where we're at from an Esquina planning perspective. Another question, how does your design team uh, utilize and interact with those funds? Okay, so our design team currently, uh, all designers, Justice and Brothers, are using the system to create tech packs. They manage design intent, creating the initial tech pack. They also are using sample management. Um, so our overseas merchants are then receiving development sample requests, for example. They're also using the tool to then hand off when ready to our tech design partners who then are responsible for instruction, construction, points of measure. Let me back up one second. Designers are also responsible for the build materials. So that, they're using the system, you know, 95% of the trade zone functionality. Okay, we've got a similar question, but in the three or four on the same lines, which is effectively, what about QA? The quality you use the system, how has it changed their life? So quality management is being uh, piloted in the November time frame, so we've not got our quality partners in. Now, we will be engaging our overseas QA partners who are responsible for inline testing, for example. And what they'll be doing in the application is they're going to be able to you know, log in and attach test results, so that's going to give us visibility up front sooner. So I'll be able to share more information, I would say, you know, at a later date in regards to our internal QA and managing high-risk product. Another question, what have been the biggest challenges to user adoption of MLM as opposed to PLM, and how have they been overcome? That's a really good question. question. So, you know, <laughs> PLM was an interesting journey. I, you know, I was consulting at the time when I came in for PLM, and then when I took an internal position, you know, we focused all of our strength and energy on stabilizing. And we can all come to the agreement that we over-customize, period. And we over-complicated, and we didn't know what we didn't know. And, you know, so we asked for it or told our trade zone partners to do it, and they did it. And it, you know, then we had to kind of revert, revert back to making things a little more simple. So that was a huge difference and the implementation. In addition to that, you know, having very specific roles, leading spaces. So, you know, make sure that you have a project manager who is a, a competent, a good project manager. Not anybody can be a project manager. Make sure you have a technical partner who is your, he is dedicated and focused. You have a business partner who is leading on the business side. You have that same trade stone expertise. So, you know, we want to make sure that we have experts in the right seats driving, trusting experts. Okay, another one regarding your vendors. How do you support your remote vendors after initial training? So right now I have direct reports that sit in Hong Kong uh, and Seoul, South Korea, and they are the main point person when there are questions relative to vendors. So right now we have seven vendor partners, a total of just under 30 vendor users that are in the system. We have teams that we've sent over, for example, with, with Brothers, we sent um, technical, internal business analysts, I sent a training team over to support their go-live, and we use you know, a TCS support inbox to make sure we're measuring and managing. Um, we have Eric and Kevin, who are my direct reports, they'll go to the vendor, to their location to give training if necessary. We've got business process sessions that happen after training that are inclusive of our vendors, so that are, that's also helpful from a support perspective. So again, we're that multi-prong approach to really going over the top. <laughs> Here's one, maybe the final one. Are your executive team happy with you? <laughs> <sighs> 
I would really like to think so. <laughs> now, we are, our executive team is quite happy. And when I think about what makes them happy, of course, we're, we're on time and we're on budget. That, that makes them really happy. But more importantly, um, I've seen a shift in culture and interest and in really taking the technology uh, to the next level. Um, so overall, I, you know, I've not been scolded in, in you know, quite some time, so I guess that's good. That's great. It sounds as though you have great executive sponsorship. It is, yes. So I'm afraid we're out of time. So Hannah, it's been fabulous of you to join us. We, we're very grateful for you and all your colleagues that have seen us. On time, on budget, a successful broad mm -hmm. uh, implementation deserves yeah. a lot of congratulations. Um, thank you again. Well, thank you so much. Great. Thanks, everybody.